Mrs. Miniver Comes Home from Jan Struthers' Mrs. Miniver It was lovely, thought Mrs. Miniver, nodding goodbye to the flower woman and carrying her big sheaf of chrysanthemums down the street with a kind of ceremonious joy, as though it were a cornucopia. It was lovely, this settling down again, this tidying away of the summer into its box, this taking up of the thread of one's life where the holidays, irrelevant interlude, had made one drop it. Not that she didn't enjoy the holidays, but she always felt, and it was, perhaps, the measure of her peculiar happiness, a little relieved when they were over. Her normal life pleased her so well that she was half afraid to step out of its frame in case one day she should find herself unable to get back. This spell might break, and the atmosphere be impossible to recapture. But this time, at any rate, she was safe. There was the house, as neat and friendly as ever, facing her as she turned the corner of the square, its small stucco face as indistinguishable from the others, to a stranger, as a single sheep in a flock, but to her apart, individual, a shade lighter than the house on the left, a shade darker than the house on the right, with one plaster rosette missing from the lintel of the front door and the first-floor balcony almost imperceptibly crooked. And there was the square itself, with the leaves still as thick on the trees as they had been when she left in August, but in August they had hung heavily, a uniform dull green, whereas now, crisped and brindled by the first few nights of frost, they had taken on a new, various beauty. Stepping lightly and quickly down the square, Mrs. Miniver suddenly understood why she was enjoying the forties so much better than she had enjoyed the thirties. It was the difference between August and October, between the heaviness of late summer and the sparkle of early autumn, between the ending of an old phase and the beginning of a fresh one. She reached her doorstep. The key turned sweetly in the lock. That was the kind of thing one remembered about a house. Not the size of the rooms or the color of the walls, but the feel of door handles and light switches, the shape and texture of the banister rail under one's palm, minute tactual intimacies whose resumption was the essence of coming home. Upstairs in the drawing-room there was a small bright fire of logs, yet the sunshine that flooded in through the open windows had real warmth in it. It was perfect. She felt suspended between summer and winter, savoring the best of them both. She unwrapped the chrysanthemums and arranged them in a square glass jar, between herself and the light, so that the sun shone through them. They were the big, mop-headed kind, burgundy-colored, with curled petals. Their beauty was noble, architectural, and as for their scent, she thought, as she buried her nose in the nearest of them, it was a pure distillation of her mood a quintessence of all that she found gay and intoxicating and astringent about the weather, the circumstances, her own age and the season of the year. Oh, yes, October certainly suited her best. For the ancients, as she had inescapably learnt at school, it had been the eighth month. Nowadays, officially, it was the tenth. But for her, it was always the first, the real new year. That laborious affair in January was nothing but a name. She turned away from the window at last. On her writing-table lay the letters which had come for her that morning, a card for a dress show, a shooting invitation for Clem, two dinner parties, three sherry parties, a highly apparative notice of some chamber music concerts, and a letter from Vin at school. Would she please send on his umbrella, his camera, and his fountain pen, which leaked, rather? But even that could not daunt her to-day. She rearranged the fire a little, mostly for the pleasure of handling the fluted steel poker, and then sat down by it. Tea was already laid. There were honey sandwiches, brandy snaps, and small ratafia biscuits, and there would, she knew, be crumpets. Three new library books lay virginally on the fender stool, their bright paper wrappers unsullied by subscriber's hand. The clock on the mantelpiece chimed, very softly and precisely, five times. A tug hooted from the river. A sudden breeze brought the sharp tang of a bonfire in at the window. The jigsaw was almost complete, but there was still one piece missing. And then, from the other end of the square, came the familiar sound of the Wednesday barrel organ, playing with a hundred apocryphal trills and arpeggios, the blue nanu blots. And Mrs. Miniver, with a little sigh of contentment, rang for tea.